soon. I hope everybody enjoyed lunch, got to sit out in the sun a little bit at the stadium. And now we are back for our main panel of the day about California and what is the optimal generation mix. We've got an esteemed panel with representing many perspectives on this issue. But we are pleased to welcome Professor Dan Kamen as our moderator. He is the class of 1935 Distinguished Professor of Energy here at Berkeley. Uh, he has parallel appointments in the Energy and Resources Group and also the Goldman School of Public Policy uh, and the Department of Nuclear Engineering. Got a lot of bases covered. He was appointed um, and he's served in various uh, commissions, uh, including work on the IPCC, and is a great friend to Burke. So we're very thankful for his time here leading this panel. Thank you, Dan. Wonderful. Thanks so much. <clears throat> well, thank you all for being here, and thank Burke for putting on what remains the country's premier student-run energy uh, conference of the year with all kinds of interesting events, and I hope you're going to enjoy both the panel now, the sessions to come, and then the keynote by Tom Steyer at the end of the day. And we have both an incredibly accomplished panel of people who are planning out and making happen a lot of California's energy future. And we also have an interesting opportunity in today's really interesting title to say what is California's optimal or ideal generation mix, and we'll talk about what it means to be ideal and what, and, 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 and what are the, the challenges in getting there. So what we have is a chance here to really get into the planning horizon for the state and for the region and for the region at a point when we are making a lot of those choices. And I think you're going to hear from people who are on the commission to at the utilities um, who have experience in getting not kilowatts, not megawatts, but gigawatts of clean energy into operation a really interesting set of opportunities. So before I introduce the panelists, let me just say a little bit about some of the, some of the planning and framing issues we're going to come back to during, during the panel. If we start off and ask what is the, uh, the optimal mix, it's going to be difficult to define that without at least thinking about what, our, or what do we have in, um, on the books already in terms of what are the laws, what are the requirements. And so there's many ways to frame this, uh, to frame this out. Um, but in the California Energy Future Study, one very elegant and clean way to put this together has been highlighted to think about the generation mix that, that we have if we were on a business as not usual for California, but business as usual in other places. So I would say this is the, the business as unusual or the business as unacceptable path in terms of greenhouse gas intensity and different uh, fuels in the mix. And California has some remarkable experience, as you all know, and the panelists will talk about, in doing better on a whole variety of aspects of this box, if you will, of emissions we're going to need to beat down dramatically by more or less 80%. So California has the longest uh, record in the country of being more efficient. So if we think about this picture of being more efficient in terms of fuels used, electricity not needed, um, so megawatts versus megawatts, we can compress this box down uh, uh, by efficiency. The mantra in the state in many ways is shifting to electrify everything and find the opportunities to take advantage of our cleaner mix today and our anticipated even cleaner mix down the road for where we're going to go. So if electrification is also part of the story, this shifts the box um, from your perspective off to the, off to the right um, to take advantage of more and more electricity to do more and more of the tasks. And then if we think about low carbon fuels and the way we manage and the way we do the analysis to make sure that those fuels are cleaner involves a lot of metrics that are tricky and complicated for everyone, for academics, for industry, for regulators, but we've got to think about if we can define more sustainable fuels on electricity or the biofuel side, then we're going to shrink down and we're going to, we're going to decarbonize this mix so that we're going to use our more sustainable fuels to crush the size of that box down even more to think about a final mix taking advantage of all these features, 
efficiency, electrification, low carbon inputs to the process to get us a final box consistent with our 2050 targets where we've started off with that world of emissions that California never planned to be on. So it's not business as usual, it's business as some alternate non-California reality. But that final target is where we're headed. And what's interesting about the different perspectives you'll hear as we go along today is that there's a whole bunch of different tools at our disposal. We are wonderfully blessed with the, the renewable and other resources you hear talked about, but the real key part of the process is the brain power and the smart systems of the individuals you're going to hear and of what we can do. And so in modeling that my lab does to look at a whole variety of scenarios, uh, we have a model of California in the West where we look at what power costs might be in a whole range of cases. Is there nuclear? Is there not nuclear? Are gas prices high or low? Do we meet and go well beyond targets like the federal sunshot to get solar down to a dollar a watt? What do we do with storage? And all of those things highlight a whole range of different outcomes. And the message that comes back, and I think you'll hear from the panelists over and over again, is that smart, adaptable systems in terms of the hardware, the procurement, the policies, the R&D, allow us to think about a world dramatically different than the world we're in today, so that if we look at a mix of generation, kind of a, a snapshot just out of our model, for example, for 2050, a picture like this, where the black line at the top is a forecast demand for 2050, and then mixtures of solar and geothermal and biopower and hydro and gas and things are all in there, and the little orange below the axis is what we think the storage needs will be. You put all that together and you get a world where the utility model of not just the 1950s, but the utility model that we're in the tail end of today with lots of baseload generation and then little bits of other things being added in is totally gone, where there's a much more dynamic picture, where smart adaptive systems, where purchases, where routing power in, in unusual routes, where using all these things in a very dynamic way is probably where we're going. That is not the utility, that is not the regulator's world that we were thinking about um, th 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 that's the world of our past. And so how we meet these and how we then define an optimal mix is what we're going to get the panelists to talk about. And it's really a brave new world in a, in a great number of ways. One of the things we'll come back to, just so you have seen some kind of extreme versions, is a picture, and I'll ask all the panelists later on, on their opinion of what is the famous or infamous duck. Um, and this is, an, this is a picture of how much fossil generation we might need to have on the grid to meet the demand. Zero means midnight, 6 a.m., midday, where if we have lots of solar and potentially other renewables on the system, we might need, at the end of the day, to rapidly ramp up a whole bunch of potentially quite dirty supplies to make the neck of this duck. And do we even need to deal with the duck is one of the questions we'll come back to. We have a whole bunch of aspects of this we'll, that we'll come to, but we'll, let, me, let, me do one, let me do two things. I'll introduce the panelists, and then our CEC Commissioner, Dave Hostia, will give us a kind of a quick snapshot of some of the projects going, going online and, and at the moment. And so we really do have people that, is, that span a number of different critical aspects of the of, of story. Um, we have um, on the far end, uh, 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 Dr. Barnack, who is currently at Calpine. Before that, um, he was at PG&E. He has been involved in the litigation and the, and the assessment of California's energy crisis, which seems to many of us a long time ago now, but it's remarkable how, fa how far we've come from that point. Sheldon Kimber is, um, is, this, is this chief operating officer at Recurrent Energy, and as you'll hear, they've installed huge amounts, again, not kilowatts, not megawatts, but gigawatts of clean power, and are looking at very large-scale future projects, a world that Again, even a decade ago, we thought about mainly analytically and in academic conversations, and now we're seeing the build out exceeding those kinds of numbers. It's a remarkable world. Uh, Micah Myers um, is right now at Clean Power Finance. Um, he, has an, he has experience in, in, in a whole range of projects. He's uh, been engaged with local companies now like Alphabet Energy that are thinking about what we can do to really bring novel materials to play. Um, 
David Hofstrad, I mentioned, who will speak in a second, um, is currently, was at Vote Solar and is now one of the California Energy Commissioners, which is a testament, I think, to uh, recycling in a good way and moving people back and forth in and out of advocacy, energy, and now analyst company roles, and now at, 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 the, C, um, at the CEC as one of the commissioners. Um, Todd Strauss is uh, officially Senior Director for Energy Policy Planning and Analytics at Pacific Gas and Electric, which means he's in a unique position to see, kick the tires, and assess all of the contracts coming in. It's a remarkable position to think about what mix of energy he has experience at Resources for the Future, um, as both Berkeley and Yale University degrees. Um, and so we've got a, what's that? MIT degrees. And MIT, oh, it says, uh, okay, um, MIT degrees. Um, and so again, we'll get into all of the, uh, the aspects of this. I missed, missed one. Nope, okay, good. Um, Okay, um, so we'll, we'll get into this, but I'll start off with Dave giving us a little bit on projects that are, um, that are coming online to, to set the stage, and then we'll return to some, some questions and discussion. Great, well, welcome, friends. Good to be here. Dan, I heard you introduced as the class of 1935, distinguished professor. I just want to say you age very well. <laughs> Must be the fountain of youth working here. Um, just one comment I'd make at the outset, what we're trying to do in California is very hard, right? 33% and beyond, but a little bit of history. Um, what I, I would argue that that is exactly what we are good at doing. And 40 years ago, when the Energy Commission was founded, if you just go back to that time, what was happening, okay? Some things were not so different. The governor was a guy named Jerry Brown, who'd replaced a Republican movie star, uh, Ronald Reagan, as governor, so some things were, were not so different. Um, but at that time, the Rand Corporation did a study, and they found that load was growing, growing at 8% a year. And the only way to deal with this was to build 40 nuclear power plants along the coast. We have an 800-mile coast. That means a nuclear power plant every 20 miles, okay? So that did not happen because the Energy Commission was founded, along with some other agencies, pushed very hard by the legislature to get very serious about efficiency and alternative energy. And today we have one nuclear power plant on the coast, not 40, and we're using half the energy per capita of the rest of the country because we have the strictest energy efficiency standards in our appliances and our buildings. Okay, that's a success story. We've done that. The context now, we're trying to do to get to 33% renewables. You know, a lot of people said this was a pipe dream, could not happen. And I want to begin with just a very quick three-minute tour of California's clean energy. This is the Ivanpah Solar Project. So this is uh, the largest solar thermal project in the world. It's 370 megawatts. It's about just on the California border, just uh, 45 minutes west of Las Vegas. What you're looking at there are three 450-foot towers. The top part has the boiler, and they're surrounded by 173,000 heliostats, which are essentially 10-foot, roughly by 15-foot mirrors that are on an algorithm as the sun moves across the sky. They focus the sun's light on the top, heat the boiler, and you get power, okay? Uh, this project is 99% complete. The first unit comes online at the end of this month the second unit at the end of next month, and the last unit at the end of December. So uh, really exciting project. This is Desert Sunlight. This is the world's largest thin film PV project. It's in Riverside County. It's um, gonna be 550 megawatts in size. It's today about 300 megawatts installed. They are installing it at a rate of a megawatt a day. Uh, for anyone who's been involved in the solar industry, it was not so long ago, you know, it was a huge deal if your company did a megawatt in a year. This is the scale we're at. This is a, a lower efficiency cadmium telluride fixed tilt thin film. Um, and it's actually, the technology has improved even since they started insulation. The panels have gotten much more efficient. And actually, um, going forward, all the thin film projects basically are going to be on trackers. It's cost justified to do that. The efficiency has gotten high enough. Um, this is the world's largest wind farm, also in California. This is the Alta Wind Energy Project in Kern County. When you think of Kern County in California, you think of oil, right? The largest oil producer in the state. But actually, this project is the second largest taxpayer in Kern County today. $40 million a year to the local tax base. They have about 600 turbines there. They're installing mostly three megawatt turbines. And it has enabled GE to have a wind turbine factory on site where they're making, they're adding another 200 megawatts uh, as we speak, which will be on by the end of the year. And they're shipping from this factory, not just for this project, but to wind sites throughout the Western United States. So huge success story there. 
This is the world's largest crystal and silicon PV project. This is a Sun Power project, the Antelope Valley Solar Project, 579 megawatts, uh, now under construction in, in San Luis Obispo. And this is the world's largest geothermal power plant uh, in Napa County, 955 megawatts, the geysers. Um, and of course, this is a resource I think that's particularly important now since we did lose a nuclear plant earlier in the year, the San Onofre plant, uh, this, you know, unlike the others, is, uh, is you know, 24 hours a day uh, clean power. And this is the world's largest parabolic trough solar plant, also in California. 310 megawatts, uh, the SEGS plant in San Bernardino County, and it has been operating actually for 26 years. And I think it's a real testimony to the reliability of, uh, of renewables. So in closing, I just wanted to sh show you kind of what's going on. Basically, if you look today where we are, okay, where the dotted line represents, so wind would be, you know, roughly a third, geothermal another third, and then, you know, bio and a few of the others. Uh, the main thing that's changing from now until 2020 is the rapid growth of solar PV. So we're basically going from a renewables portfolio today that's, about 5% solar to one that's going to be about 50% solar by 2020. And most of that is represented by PV. And so I just want to unpack that for a minute because it's so significant. Basically, PV is winning pretty much hands down on all the bids because the cost has come down since 1980. The cost of solar panels have come down 98%. Okay, And it's not just the price of the panels that's gone down. It's also the inverters becoming more efficient and the tracking systems becoming better and uh, this is actually, I would argue, the single most transformative change that's happened in the renewable energy space. And as we look ahead at what that means for distributed generation, it really does, uh, you know, I think, have the chance to be a, a, a transformative factor uh, on energy. But uh, the good news is that the costs have, have come down. So as we make these you know, decisions about energy, I, I think it's worth bearing in mind everything is kind of on a three-legged stool of reliability, cost and environmental protection. And those three needs need, need to be met. And that's, I think, the lens through which most of the policymakers and certainly the governor, uh, you know, thinks about these things. But uh, the final thing I'd say is last week, the governor signed, um, you know, pretty much the biggest and most significant energy bill this year, AB 327, which does a number of things. Um, uh, but in his signing statement, he, he made clear that 33% by 2020 is just the floor, not the ceiling. And so there will be a successor policy, and that was very clear uh, you know, in his direction. So with that, I uh, look forward to the panel. Thanks a lot. All right. It's kind of a great story to hear the uh, first, the biggest for a whole bunch of these. So there's a remarkable uh, set of projects coming. So let's back up and get our, our panelists engaged in the discussion because there's so many interesting aspects of the story. To, to dig into. Let me start off with the one I, I mentioned before, and that is that for all of the discussion about, do we lose a, ah, got it, okay. Um, so what, what I mentioned before, there we go. So th there's a lot of discussion both in the technical and trade, uh, uh, trade lit literature and in terms of policy questions about this ominous duck. And so before we get to all of the neat things that are coming, let me get uh, our, our panelists' perspective. And again, with the story that's, um, that, that, that's embodied here is that we're used to thinking about a, demand, uh, about a demand curve during the day in California that, of course, is low in the middle of the night and peaks in the late afternoon. And it potentially doubly peaks because a lot of people are still at work and people are turning things on at home. And so you get a very large demand at the end of the day, this increased ramp. And so the story of the duck is if this is the fossil we might need to back up the systems, should we worry about this neck? Should we worry about the head of the duck as a point when our solar and things are going down and we've got to build that up? So what if we start at the far end and just get, get comments on, should we worry about this and what are some of the strategies that we might do? And we'll just go down, get, go down the line. Um, the first thing is, I just note it's become an amazingly powerful meme. Um, I was at a technical conference at FERC a couple weeks ago, and it had nothing to do with California, nothing to do with renewables. It was about the, the capacity markets in the Northeast. And two uh, FERC commissioners mentioned the, the duck chart and sort of asked, 
participants in the conference whether this was something they should be worried about. Um, so it's, it's sort of taken on a life of its own. Um, I guess the other point I'd like to make is it's, it's, I think it's frequently misinterpreted. Um, we're, we're blessed in California not only with uh, geothermal and sunlight and, and wind, um, but also uh, an amazingly operationally flexible um, stock of generation that consists mostly of, of natural gas fire generation and, and hydro. Um, so in the, near, in the near term, the duck is, is not really a problem because the system is so flexible already. And um, you know this 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 picture that is you know frequently used to scare people, this is from a March day, and 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 you'll notice that that net load on this day peaks at maybe you know 25 gigawatts, and you know we have you know make up a number 50 or 60 or 70 gigawatts lying around to solve this problem, all of which is you know plenty plenty fast to meet these kinds of ramps now. The ISO has done a lot of more, more detailed modeling underlying the duck chart, and in certain cases, they do find the need to, you know, add more flexible resources to the system, but what, what's not always well understood about those results is the need they're identifying is really for generic capacity. It doesn't need to be fast. Um, it's, a, it's a really a traditional kind of peak capacity requirement. And you know, as long as we have more resources to free up the flexible resources uh, that, that we already have, flexibility is, is uh, not really a problem. So I guess count, count me as a bit of a duck chart yeah. skeptic. Okay. <laughs> Sheldon? Well, I would say that uh, uh, being, uh, being the, an executive of one of the larger solar developers in the, in the country, um, I, I definitely fear the duck chart, and I, I fear it not because um, it's real or it, it has veracity, but, or you know, it's 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 it, 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 but that it gets out there, and it gets in people's minds, um, as 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 um, as as was just mentioned. Uh, I think that that there are two things that I, that bother me most about it. Um, one is just the the fact that um, you know the technical assumptions that underlie the duck chart are actually quite old. So, uh, you know, Kaiso, when you, when you look at, you know, the, the massive solar plants that have, been, that have been built or are being built, they've all been built in the last year, two years, three years tops, and there's actually not a lot of good data on them. So there's really a fairly large dispute between many of the operators right now and some of the developers of those plants as to what those plants can do, how, much, how long, long into the evening they're going to perform, you know, and, and some of the assumptions that underlie the duck curve are things like, you know, largely fixed tilt solar and not tracking, right? Um, and lower, lower efficiencies, older technologies, those sorts of things. So it's, it's not necessarily, it's data is not particularly good to begin with. And the second piece is just that the reason it's getting so much play is that, in, in my view, is more of a, an organizational or political issue, and that is that the California ISO only has one role right now, and that's to keep the lights on. And, and I get that. That's, that's, that's their job. But if you tell someone your, your entire performance is going to be measured on keeping the lights on, they're going to tell you we need to build a, a megawatt of gas for every bit of intermittent renewables on the system. And that doesn't make any sense. Uh, what we need to be able to do is basically have partners in the ISO or add to the mandate of the ISO um, that, that they have to be part of this vision of a you know, carbon-free energy mix. Um, and I think making that part of their mandate will give us better analysis on issues like this. Mike? Thanks. No argument from me. I think we're all mostly going to agree you know, that this is a ducked up chart. Um, this, is a, this is a duck that won't walk, yeah, is that what you're saying? A <laughs> ducked up chart. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm not going to be yeah, a proponent. There was, uh, I, I had prepared a couple slides, and one of the ones I was going to show is an actual spring load yeah. day from Germany. And I think this is representative of uh, a few of the fear tactics that we've seen come out. This one, uh, it's iconic, it, it's, it's made the rounds. Um, but if you hold everything fixed and you model something, you're probably going to get it wrong. Uh, because something will probably change. If you look at what's actually happening in, in Germany, uh, in the real world, not hypothetically, uh, the solar actually elegantly matches the peak load on an average spring day. 
And, uh, and we're fairly confident that, that market forces will take care of, of issues like this. And you can zoom in as far as you want. You'll always find some volatility uh, that has to be matched. But um, you know, we're in Silicon Valley, and, and there are no problems, just opportunities. So, Dave, I'm going to skip you for a second and come back, just because we'll do uh, on, the, on the company side. So, uh, Todd, you have, you have to uh, approve the contracts to uh, cut the deck's, duck's neck off, I guess. PG&E is in the business of providing safe, reliable, affordable power. Every utility across the country says that. And so, California, it's safe, reliable, affordable, and clean. And so what's the duck chart? It basically has to be looked at through those lenses, particularly reliable, affordable, and clean. And I think what I've heard so far is kind of missing the mark from what the duck chart really means. First off, that picture looks a lot different from the way we thought the future would be 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we thought, OK, a lot of renewables, it means a lot of wind, it means a lot of wind showing up in the Central Valley in Tehachapi at 3 a.m. when there's no load. This picture is very different. This says, in fact, we have a lot of solar, possibly, in the middle of the day, and not enough load in the middle of the day. So forecasts are wrong. The future will be different from what we expect. That's one of the messages of the duck chart. Then, to deal with reliability, what do we need to do? The duck chart has four elements associated with it. That is, the morning ramp up from uh, solar and from load, and then the uh, middle of the day breast that dips and dips and dips as we go forward in the future, and then that long craning neck. And so what we're really talking about, what attributes of products are needed to meet reliability for the system? And so we need that ramping for that afternoon. We need that flexibility. And it means a lot of different things for lots of different kinds of resources in ways that were not anticipated. But I heard Dan and I heard Sheldon talk about gas plants for the ramping. No, we need ramping. What can provide that? Could be existing peakers. Could be future peakers. Could be demand response. Could be shifting load. So there are a variety of ways to meet the needs. What's important is to identify the needs and then figure out the resources that can provide those capabilities in a way that's reliable for the system, that provides low cost for customers, and that provides clean energy. I heard Michael refer to market forces. Very much so. So the key is to identify the products that match the reliability attributes needed and then get them in a competitive manner. And that's what California policy has really been about. Dave, why don't you? Oh, I agree. Duck has, has migrated. Uh, and I mean, this charge has been pretty widely debunked. It is the worst single day in a two-year <laughs> period. And I don't even think the ISO is using it anymore. But with that said, I do think you know, the biggest challenge, I integration is a, is a real challenge. And you know, the chart I showed earlier, the point of that is 80% you know, of our renewables are going to be wind and solar by 2020. So those are intermittent resources, and so we do need to be managing that. But I don't think the the, chuck, the, the, the chart itself represents um, the, uh, the the sort of scale of the challenge. Okay. So in in thinking about the ideal mix as we go ahead, let me ask the next question. And um, and Todd raised it in 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 his response there, and that. There's a real interesting situation coming in terms of the role and the future of gas. And we have unprecedented low gas prices now, and there's forecasts all over the place for how long does it stay cheap and what happens both in the US and in China and elsewhere. And we've had the president say in his famous summer speech on climate that we were going to, as a country, pivot from coal to gas. My view of a pivot actually involves a starting point, an interim point, and an end point. I didn't hear the end point discussed at the federal level, but we thankfully think about California first. So let's go back from Todd the other way and, and comment on how do you think about and utilize gas's benefits now, but recognize that our overall portfolio is going to eventually need to clean out even the gas. And so what are we thinking about in the medium and longer term as an economic and a environmental gas strategy? In California today, natural gas is a dirty fuel. 
And so go tell that to someone from China or India or Brazil or elsewhere, or, or Indiana or Georgia. And so when you look at California energy policy from that lens, we're looking for lots of carbon-free resources going forward. And when you look to see the gas plants, the gas-fired power plants that are in place and are anticipated to come online to be built, they're not running at 90% of the time, the way some forecasts had a few years ago, and the way they might be in a place um, like China or elsewhere where there's a lot of coal-fired power plants, and so we get a lot of clean energy from the gas replacing coal. We're looking at combined cycle power plants in California running less than 50% of the time. That in PG&E, when we had a solicitation in 2005, we asked for a combined cycle power plant to start at least 300 times a year. And so very different kinds of operations from gas plants today and in the future for when people think these things are running flat out. And so natural gas fired power plants are basically providing the load following, the flexibility that's needed to the system. And as we get additional kinds of flexibility from other resources, whether it be demand response, whether it be storage, whether it be being able to control better the wind turbine blades and uh, use inverters off the solar, well, we might use less and less capacity from natural gas. But the energy from natural gas is relatively small. Yeah, I think one of the, I think we just need to be very thoughtful and careful in uh, these decisions and not overbuild gas capacity that's going to be with us for another 50 years because, um, and to the extent that gas capacity gets built, one technology advance that's happened that's worth noting is that the peaker plants, which are these flexible resources you can turn on in 10 minutes uh, and used to be you know, much dirtier than combined cycle, the, the technology has improved. So you actually get much, much higher efficiencies with these new peakers that Lodi and others in the state have installed. And so to the extent what you're looking for is flexibility that may not be you know, these resources may not be on that much. I mean, that's, that's what you'd want to be deploying. As a, as a former gas guy um, who, <laughs> who, 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 who still loves the technology. Does that mean you're reformulated I, gas? I, I, what's I, that, what does I, that mean, actually? I, I, I pine for natural gas technologies. It was so, it was so, uh, uh, so much simpler than solar, um, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, no, I think in California, you know, uh, that, that's pretty much right on. I, I, I think as a renewables guy, you hear a lot more, um, uh, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit more willing to concede that, that perhaps there is some natural gas that's necessary, um, because I don't want to sound like that um, renewables zealot, if you will, that, that, that says it can all be done with renewables. So um, it's, it's good to hear PG&E and, and others sort of saying that, that you know, uh, the fact is that, that we probably won't build a lot of other gas because I think it, it does line up with the vision of the future where, um, you know, solar and wind and, and, and geothermal and, and the gas that we have can, can, can get us there. Uh, that said, I think, uh, you know, I, I think we have not yet seen the, uh, the end of gas, certainly nationally, and, uh, and, and so as, 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 as we think about um, what that means for California, if we're, you know, I know there was a pa panel earlier this year, uh, earlier this week here about um, fracking the Monterey Shale, and I think maybe California then, um, you know, it's less about generation and more about um, what we do with our gas resources and how we get how we get value from them from the parties that are going to need it for generation. So, just to put things in perspective, I'm. I we, we, ha we have just shy of 30,000 megawatts uh, nationally. Most of it, except for the geysers, is, is gas-fired. Um, so I, I, I come at things from a slightly different perspective, although I'm going to pick up on things that, that Todd, David, and, and Sheldon all said. So the way Dan framed the question, it was almost as if, you know, should we worry about cheap gas undermining renewables mandates in California? And I think you know, the answer is, is probably no, because California will do whatever it's going to do regardless of the economics. So the economics almost don't, don't matter. <laughs> um, um, and, and so I, I agree that in, that in California, 
you know, gas fire generation, you know, the role is increasingly shifting towards, you know, providing more capacity services and away from providing energy. So related to something that David said, I, I, I agree completely that we, we shouldn't be building a lot of additional uh, new gas fire generation to solve the duck charter for other reasons. Um, we have a lot of existing gas fire generation already that could be utilized much more fully, that could be made more flexible, and we should be relying on that to provide, uh, you know, these capacity services. But then I also just wanted to, you know, provide an outside of California uh, perspective. So we are building new gas generation in, in other markets, primarily in Texas and PJM. And, you know, shale gas in markets where economics matter is just a, is just a game changer. And so we're, we're pursuing a lot of development in those markets, especially where we can compete with coal. And um, it's, it's, that's just a huge deal. Um, I, since 2007, nationally, um, the, the annual emissions from the power sector have declined by 300 million um, metric tons per year. You know, that's just to put that in perspective, the, the 2020 AB32 cap, I think, is 427 million mm -hmm. metric tons per year. So this national decline of 300, uh, decline in the annual rate of 300 million metric tons is roughly on the scale of all of California's emissions. That's happened since 2007 without any RP, you know, without RPS in a lot of jurisdictions, without any kind of significant GHG policy, and it's just driven by cheap shale gas and, and coal to gas switching. So I think that, that outside of California framing, you know, is, is sometimes helpful. Yeah. I, I think that, that, that Dave, thankfully, oh, you want to, now, now you want to weigh in, right? Good, okay. <laughs> Uh, comment. I, I think I'm the, the token distributed resource uh, panelist up here. So uh, one slightly different perspective on natural gas, and this one you know, really comes out of energy and David Crane, uh, who sits on these things and, uh, and gets a little provocative sometimes. But you could also envision a world where you know, natural gas is the other form of energy that complements distributed solar in the home and other technologies that convert that straight to electricity or into other sorts of work that's required in the home. So in California, the utilities all own electric distribution, at least the investor-owned utilities own electric distribution as well as gas distribution. Not as big a fear in the rest of the US. A lot of times those holding companies are different. And so I'd be very worried as the uh, electric distribution company about the technologies that are looming that could take natural gas and let natural gas distribution utilities compete with electric utilities. One final point I would, I would make. Before we build any new gas, we got to do more in efficiency. And I just would point out, we're sitting here at UC Berkeley, one of the most forward-thinking institutions with, you know, incredible leadership, the faculty, and, you know, in a room that's lit by incandescent lights, right? These are probably 60-watt incandescents, right? And now I make this point just because a month ago, uh, something very significant happened, which is the first LED bulb on the market that meets the Energy Commission's new quality standards got introduced. Fortunately for these guys, it was a company called Cree. Yep. Unfortunately, they launched it on the same day as the new iPhone. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a really poor day. Uh, but the point is, you know, there's a bulb now with light that's indistinguishable from incandescent. This light bulb lasts for 25 years. It uses 80% less energy. It's dimmable, and unlike CFLs, there's no mercury. I mean, the technology is here, and we have a deployment problem. 60% of the lights in the state of California are still incandescents, despite the fact we're spending $1.3 billion a year on these rebates for efficiency. We have all these strict new standards for new buildings. There is a lot of low-hanging fruit. Uh, so next time we come to a conference, I'm hoping to see new light bulbs. <laughs> So I would like to be able to say, you know, not in my jurisdiction, but unfortunately, if we believe we're integrated, we should all be talking across campus. And I, I noticed the bulbs, too. So let me ask a question about this deployment of new technology issue. And one of the topics that's come up a lot, we have very exciting new research coming out of the universities, spurred in some part by work at ARPA-E at DOE on storage. And we hear all the time that storage could potentially be the thing that 
that deals with ramping issues and allows solar to be effectively a nighttime issue, it's a, a source, et cetera. And so let me just ask you in, in sort of more general terms for everyone to get online. I'll, again, I'll start with you, Todd, and we'll go the other way again. And that is, what do you see as the next decade of storage? We have a storage requirement coming out of the PUC. How do you see that playing into the mix down the line? Is it a technology issue, an economics issue, a regulation one? So l let, me, let me start by looking at renewables and what can we learn um, about storage from renewables. California's renewable portfolio standard has greatly benefited from Chinese subsidies and federal tax credits. That has really helped make renewables affordable in California. And if we can get Chinese subsidies and federal tax credits for storage, great. The issue isn't one of technology. The issue isn't one of technology. There are a variety of technological choices. The question is one, what's the economics at a scale large enough to be deployed widely for the system? And it's open season. We'll find out when, per the impending requirement, uh, we hold a request for offers next year, and we see what com comes in in terms of live bids and what it costs, um, and how it compares to market and what attributes they bring. So we're you know, prepared and geared up for that opportunity, and I'm sure it provides a, a gold rush. The concern we have, one of the biggest costs associated with the renewable program that we've impl implemented in California, the headline's always X percent by Y year. There's a lot of details with the terms and conditions. It's not just the fact that California now has 33 percent by 2020. It's what counts and what doesn't count. The rules are very stringent for what counts. And they are, that's part of uh, an important element of any storage program that can be put in place. And finally, one of the most costly elements to the Renewable Portfolio Standard Program in California actually is not 20 percent, and it's not 33 percent. It was the acceleration of the original 20 percent by seven, 2017 standard, which was passed in 2002. The standard was 20 percent by 2017. In 2006, the governor signed a bill that said, let's make the standard 20 percent by 2010. That's what added a lot of costs. That's what turned it into a seller's market. That's what created basically a California gold rush, 21st century style. And it's the concern about that kind of high cost, that's what leads us to say, we recognize the storage program is for market transformation. Let's do it in a way that makes sense for our customers. David, the, the CC and the PUC are working very closely together to think through the storage issue. So I'd love if you brought yeah, that in Yeah, I support well, the so. storage decision. I think one thing to keep in mind when you set up a program that assures a market will be there, what happens is it unlocks investment that wouldn't otherwise occur. Okay, so we saw basically $75 billion of investment come into the state with renewables, with the RPS, you know, $10 billion for the California Solar Initiative uh, into the solar space, and that hugely affected the the speed with which we reach the, uh, the cost goals. And so I think some, to some degree the same thing will happen with storage. It's part of what I'd call a silver buckshot rather than a silver bullet approach. You need to have uh, you know, an effort on storage. However, it's not the only thing. I mean, there's, uh, you know, we can do much more on demand response, for example. The one other point I make about storage is the largest manufacturing facility in the state of California today is an electric car factory, Tesla. I was there a week ago, they have 3,000 people. If you look at how they're making this, it's basically a deck about four inches thick at the bottom of their car. It's filled with you know, 7,000 lithium ion batteries. And you have these industries, electric cars and laptops and cell phones driving you know, the cost reductions there, lithium ion battery. I talked to Samsung uh, recently. They're the largest manufacturer of lithium ion batteries in the world. They told me 20% cost reduction they achieved just last year alone. There is movement in this space, and I think that's uh, a decision like this will help accelerate that. Yeah. Mike, and I definitely, uh, since you, you stood up for the distributed, bring in at least uh, small batteries sure. and distributed systems, not just big compressed air and, and industrial scale facilities. A absolutely, and I think Todd brought up a great point uh, when he's talking about RPS in, in California, and 1% and of California homes have uh, installed solar on their rooftop now, which is a, a huge uh, tribute to the CSI program that was very successful. Uh, but to the utilities, that looks like demand destruction. That is electricity that they can no longer profit from on their side of the meter. 
And that's unfortunate because if we need, if we're going to deploy as much renewable uh, sources of energy over the coming decades, we need organizations that are willing to do massive project investments and willing to take relatively low risk returns over the coming decades. And if the utilities can't do it at the meter or at the, the point of load, it, it ties one arm behind their back. And there are a bunch of things. There's something called normalization and the way they rate recover and how they make their money that are really impediments to, to letting them own those distributed resources. We're looking at that. Uh, but in terms of energy storage, absolutely. One of the most exciting things, if I was in the energy storage industry, you know, would be AB 327. I know we're going to get into that here uh, a little more, but the notion of having a fixed charge or turning the grid into a network that I have to pay to connect to, that will open the door for other innovations and innovative business models to learn how to monetize energy storage at the load source. And we're, we're very excited about doing, about seeing that happen. Okay. Sheldon? I think that uh, when it comes to storage, you know, having, having, having been sort of a, 49er on the gold rush, I think, of, of, of the last few years in solar. Um, I, th I think, and also having been trained um, undergraduate degree in economics and an MBA here, um, I believe in markets, but I have to say that it's messier out there than you might otherwise think. And, and so I, I, don't, I don't think that, um, I, you know, the acceleration of that, that mandate that, that caused the gold rush. I think that that actually had something to do with some of the, the factors that you are thanking, the, the Chinese subsidies in particular, um, because what happens is when people see that scale of opportunity and they rush in, there's an overinvestment, right? And what, 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 what we've been benefiting from on the solar cell side for the last three years and why, why California has been able to hit the kind of price points that we've been able to hit is because of a massive overinvestment in module, you know, wafer, uh, cell, polysilicon um, production in China and to some degree in Russia um, that, that on the poly side that, that just overhang the entire market and collapse, crush the prices down to basically marginal cost, okay? And that's where you got this huge uptake in North America benefiting from that. I think there's a possibility and if there's any, I, I mean, if I'm a policymaker, I look at that and I say, hey, if China's willing to do that, and, and they are, because they have to put people to work, and that's the way their, their economy is sort of structured, I, I want to provoke the same kind of, of, of race in battery cells, right, in lithium-ion cells. Because I, I see the lithium-ion cell, and, and I'm, not, I'm not necessarily, you know, a technologist, so you can come up and correct me afterwards, all those folks in the, in the, in the audience working on batteries. But I see the, 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 the battery cell as almost the same thing as a solar cell. It's, it's a technology that without a huge revolution in the technology, with just something that gives it the impetus for a massive scale up, could, could come down by an order of magnitude. If that is the case, I think then the 1.2 gigawatt mandate that, that, that's come out from PUC will be hopefully the beginning of that. And hopefully, you know, that, that will essentially deliver what for the entire career, my entire career in energy has been the holy grail, which is energy storage. Just, just uh, two points on storage. At, at, the, at the time the law that sort of teed up the mandates was passed, it was not clear to me that the goal of the law was mm -hmm. transformation. Yeah, interesting. Um, it was interesting you know, really yeah. about developing storage to meet real problems that we face as, as reflected, however accurately or inaccurately, in the duck chart. And so I think you know, we need to ask ourselves, is the goal of the policy transformation or, or to use storage to address real world you know, issues that are before us. And if the policy is really the latter, you know, then why do we want to limit the procurement of storage to very specific storage technologies? You know, the, the, the mandates of the, as they've been proposed exclude pumped hydro, um, which is probably, you know, arguably the one remotely cost effective existing um, storage uh, technology, you know, why limit the solution just to storage? You know, why not, why not have storage, DR, gas, um, you know, any other flexible resource uh, compete? Um, 
and then, you know, I also am concerned that the mandates, uh, as they've been proposed, are, are poorly crafted. They're in, they're in terms of megawatts, and so um, that will tilt the procurement towards uh, relatively short duration storage technologies because those will be the, the, the cheapest, and it's unclear that, that that's what we need to address the duck chart and other problems like the duck chart. So, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on uh, Shel Sheldon's comment there, because um, there is a difference between storage and renewables uh, in terms of California policy, mm -hmm. and it goes to Spain, Germany, California. On the renewable side, California was well positioned, drafting behind Germany and Spain, and so able to take advantage of that worldwide crest and then fall. On storage, it looks like California's going first. Well, Germany does have storage in their feed-in tariff now, so partially it's on the table. So the last formal question I'm going to have to ask for kind of the lightning round in the game show world, so we have some time for the questions from the audience. But the, que the question that I've been holding off on is, of course, the, the, the least well-posed one, and it's the title of the panel, and that is, what is the ideal mix? And well, there's many ways to kind of refine that and add qualifiers, and I would, I would just ask the, the panelists to give a quick comment on, first of all, what you mean by ideal, um, and what are you thinking in the midterm, let's say 2030 and 2050, in terms of what you think we need to do and what you think we can do? Um, why, don't we start, why don't we start somewhere else we haven't done? Sheldon, let's have you go first. <laughs> Okay, through the short straw on the hard question. Exactly. Um, so, so again, I'm, you know, an executive at a large PV developer. So, I think PV has a huge role to play in, uh, the, in the ideal generation mix in California, um, for for obvious reasons. Um, I wouldn't be doing what I'm I'm doing if I if I didn't believe that. Um, but I don't I don't believe it's necessarily PV and renewables um, in the way that we've seen them to date. I. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of talking lately about what we're seeing as more uh, the era of competitive solar, and I think that um, I think that policy has done enough that solar is reaching cost points that it can compete on its own, and you'll see that in other markets, whether it be Texas or, or other parts of the country, where solar at the whole at the wholesale in the wholesale market utility scale is going to be able to go in against gas-fired power um, in the same hours of delivery. And, and compete, and you'll see that more and more. I think, I think so I think the future is, for California and the ideal generation mix for California, it looks a lot like we've, what we've been talking about. It's got you know, a good chunk of gas, which we already have largely built out, backing up an increasing amount of renewables, led, you know, the growth of which is led largely by solar PV. Um, but, I do, but I think that the contractual and sort of market mechanisms that are used to get to that um, are going to change radically in the next five to ten years. I, th I think, you know, SunPower just announced a 70 megawatt yeah. pure merchant plant yeah. in the Atacama Desert. Glad you mentioned I that. think you're going to start seeing folks, once as solar becomes cheaper, you know, starting to build plants a lot more like our friends at Calpine, where you have to know something about the power markets and you have to actually get your investor to take some equity risk on the power markets. That's going to be a very different looking renewables company, and I think you're, I hope that you'll get a lot less of the somewhat negative tags that renewables get for you know expecting the handout as that as that market changes over time. So that that's my my vision of kind of how the, the market plays out. And just to highlight that Atacama project, this is actually to sell basically entirely to big industry, to Rio Tinto and and Beijing Building and some mining companies. So you you mentioned Calpine, so why don't we just continue around and we'll go. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I, I, I think I'm going to dodge the question and, and, and pick <laughs> I knew up, at least somebody would. <laughs> yeah, pick up on some things that, that both Todd and, and Dan, you said earlier. So uh, we, we don't know what the ideal generation it, mix is. And so um, I think we need to think hard about how to structure markets and regulatory processes to achieve environmental goals at least cost with an appropriate allocation of risk between you know suppliers uh, utilities customers in the face of all that uncertainty and risk and so I think that really requires um, very nimble and flexible policy and procurement and that's something Dan that, that you pointed out in one of your 
introductory slides. And, uh, you know, I think competitive markets um, are a, a, a very kind of nimble tool for addressing policy issues and, and for procuring wholesale power. Um, so I hope we can move towards a, a competitive approach along the lines that, that Sheldon alluded to. And, you know, we can have more different kinds of resources competing with, with one another and, and uh, less siloed procurement. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll finish by making a plea for geothermal. I hope, I hope, I hope we'll, we'll have more yeah. geothermal. Um, and I think it's been underappreciated in the renewables procurement yeah. to date. And, um, you know, as, 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 as we go forward, hope, hopefully that will be rectified, so. And I'm waiting for better geothermal maps so we can put them in the model. Okay. So. Todd, are you gonna give us a RPS and a feed-in tariff and a carbon price number for, from the PG&E mm -hmm. perspective? Yeah, I've got the percentages right here. <laughs> Actually, if we look at the five million electric meters we have and the 15 million people we serve and the half million businesses we have, what's ideal to them? What's ideal to you? Lots of different opinions. And again, because this is California, clean is an important part of that ideal. And so the key question becomes, what's the trajectory between now and 2030 and 2050 that we can get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and decarbonize the grid by 2050 in a way that maintains reliability and especially maintains affordability for our customers? And so it will be about decarbonizing the grid. It will be about increasing electrification and basically for transportation and other sources. And where that comes from, whether it's renewables or nuclear or all sorts of complicated uh, transactions among customers in a distributed kind of way, we do know that the grid will become more and more valuable yeah. in each of those scenarios. Interesting point. So, so we talked a lot about risk. I mean, I, my view is the biggest risk of all is climate change. And for that reason, you know, we, we have the leadership role to play. You look at the dysfunction in Washington today, <laughs> I mean, it's an embarrassment to the country. Uh, we, we have to step up. And in a way, we're playing um, the equivalent of a national role in the global space. And so I think the answer to the question is as clean as it can be within the bounds of reliability and cost. And so the value of having another target, if you take you know 51% by 2030, which some folks have been talking about, there's other targets out there, whatever the number that ends up being adopted by uh, the governor and the legislature is, there's value in having that laid out there because there's investment that's on the sidelines now because there's no certainty. I just had a meeting a week ago with Commissioner Peterman at the, at the Public Utilities Commission. We met with the largest clean energy investors in the state and basically clean tech investments at the lowest point has been yeah. in the last four years because there's no certainty that there's gonna be a market after 2020. And so essentially what's happened is incumbent, the large scale incumbent clean energy companies are doing okay getting follow on funding, but it's the next wave of the smaller innovators. Uh, and that work matters. We need that space to be healthy because this is where the next wave of cost reduction can come. And I think that's directly linked to having policy certainty beyond 2020. So Micah, you're at clean power finance. So that was, seemed like a, a ball thrown right into the financing <laughs> court, uh, that's right? That's true. It's not clean power solar or clean solar finance. Uh, the, the other slide I was going to bring today was actually a Stanford slide, which I know would have been sacrilegious to bring on the, on, on the Berkeley campus, but it's one of my favorite slides, and it's from the uh, Global Center for Energy. It's the oh, Exergy chart, which I can't explain either because I'm not a, a scientist, but has something to do with the amount of work that can be done with the various resource of, resources of energy that we have. And you've heard the anecdote before that the sun shines enough energy on the earth in an hour that could power the, the whole global population for a year. It's not entirely true because some is reflected, some is absorbed and everything else. It turns out it's actually two hours uh, <laughs> shines enough uh, energy on the earth uh, to power us for an entire year. So I, I don't know how in 2050 we're not heavily reliant on, on the sun as a source of energy and I'm definitely long solar. Uh, I'll also say that on the, you know, whether it's centralized or distributed, I think there are business model innovations, they're going to push resources out to the edge where the load, push them closest to the load. And the way that we consume, manufacture, and store energy uh, 20 years from now will be entirely different than we do today. Yeah. So we love that GCEP slide at Stanford, uh, at Berkeley. We use it all the time, even though it comes from Stanford. Good. So we've got a little bit of time for questions. If you come up to the mic and introduce yourself, uh, 
Let's, let's, let's start uh, with Severin. Um, and address your question to please one, because otherwise we won't get through that many. Um, so it's for all, right? <laughs> there aren't, um, what is the right, I mean, another rephrase of this session could be, what's the ideal way of connecting people to their energy source? Um, and how do we pay for that? Sure. Thank you. It's another, uh, another softball uh, question. <laughs> uh, obviously referring to the death spiral that EEI uh, published a paper on uh, not too long ago, and I think a lot of utilities are, are looking at, but the, the concept is that every home that comes off the grid makes the grid a little more expensive for everyone else. Uh, so the next person comes off the grid, it gets more expensive, and, and the utility uh, goes into its death spiral. Uh, that's not going to happen. I think that, uh, that assumes a lot of people look at the cost of maintaining the grid about providing a return on equity of around 10%, uh, unlevered 6 to 7%. Really, it doesn't look at what the marginal cost of operating the grid is. And I think if you do start seeing a scenario where technologies are pushing people off the grid, I think the, uh, there are a number of things that, that could happen where the, the grid splits up into microgrids that are much more localized, or if the utilities themselves actually are, are uh, successful in convincing regulators, policymakers, and the commissions and letting them own distributed resources, which we would like to see, uh, it could be very well that the utility actually owns uh, the, the solar system on your rooftop. In fact, clean power finance, you know, we run a market between investors and the solar channel to provide residential uh, solar finance products. And the last fund that we did was done by an East Coast utility. Yeah. So we have an East Coast utility putting solar panels on California residents' rooftops, basically stealing PG&E's customers today. Uh, the next fund we close will be a utility fund. That, the fund after that that we close will be a utility fund. And so we do see the utilities getting, getting involved. And, and if you look at that progression in how the utility makes their money, I think the, the early movers will migrate to a different business model, and the ones that are slow to move uh, won't survive. Yeah. Anyone else in the panel want to jump in? Although I've, I've, I've got to add as well that, that the point that the grid is this, is this increasing valued asset strikes me to be one of the ways to make operating and maintaining the grid for true two-way real-time communication markets a place where the utilities are going to find lots and lots of value. And it's, 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 on the, it's on the regulator side and on the analyst side to figure out the mechanisms to make that work. So let's keep going. We're going we're to extend question time till 2.20 because we've got a bunch. Let's uh, go to the back. Um, question about uh, Who are your Oh, sorry. Matt Lucas, PhD here at Cal. Um, question about fuels. So, Mr. Commissioner, um, <laughs> about the renewable, uh, the low carbon fuel standard. Um, right now, I hear that California burns na more natural gas than the whole state of Texas, making steam for steam flood enhanced oil recovery in the Kern Basin. That doesn't seem like it's headed in the right direction in terms of a low carbon liquid fuel. Um, without Teslas for the masses, how do you see us getting there? So good, good question. Well, one piece of good news is that the legislature just adopted the uh, bill called AB 118, which basically authorizes us at the Energy Commission to give away a billion dollars over the next decade for clean fuels, including electric vehicle charging infrastructure, which I think will represent one of the, the, the major investments we, we make. Electric vehicles for the masses are coming. Tesla, you know, obviously is selling a $70,000 car now. Their goal, just so you know, is a $35,000 car that goes 150 miles on a charge. And, and yeah. Nissan, Toyota, GM, this is, I mean, there's heavy investment going. I, I'm actually very optimistic about the electric vehicle space. But we have a portfolio approach. We're also putting, uh, I think, $20 million a year into hydrogen. Um, and so I, I think that transformation is underway. It's, uh, I'd love to see it go faster, but that's the, that's the money we have. And the state's already doing some neat things, getting very low-cost leases for electric vehicles at the lower end. I mean, you can do, as a state employee, you can do very low-cost leases. And these incentives, so, you know, things. the governor just signed a bill, if you buy an electric vehicle, you get the, you know, carpool lane through 2019. I know that factor alone is <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very important, uh, increasingly <laughs> important as traffic gets bad. As, yeah, market Derby. Yeah, let's come up to the front. Claire Broom, um, Professor of Public Health. 
Um, I actually wanted to follow up. It was a question on the electric vehicles and specifically to Commissioner Hochschild. Uh, there have been proposals that a huge way to encourage that would be to have marginal rate pricing for um, charging of electric vehicles, for example, overnight. And since the rate structure already considers a number of different incentives, um, is the commission considering uh, something like that that would really incent electric vehicles to? Uh, so I, that is a decision made at the, at the Public Utilities Commission, not the Energy Commission. But I'm in full support of that, providing that as part of the deal, the electric vehicle battery also can become an asset for the grid because I think, mm -hmm. in fact, um, there's a lot more flexibility that we get. And as you've seen, rate design, you know, can be, right now it's been a very hot topic. I would say the good news is that in this reform that just got adopted, there will be now a whole new yep. uh, flexibility in how rates are, are set. There's, a, you know, the tier one, two rates can be, can be shifted. Um, but as part of that, I, I think we need to be designing rates keeping in mind the, the potential of electric vehicles. Not just, we have 35,000 electric vehicles on the road today in California. It's the biggest market in the country for EVs. And just so folks know, I mean, the technology is changing in very exciting ways. Just as an example, there's a bus now. They've developed, Proterra has a bus, which we funded, yeah. which uh, can go two full city routes, 30 miles, and recharge in 10 minutes, the time it takes the driver to have a bathroom break. That, that bus is here now, it's in four cities. I mean, the technology is at this point where it really can scale, but I think you hit the nail on the head, the rate design piece is gonna be critical. And to be able to charge and have the flexibility to charge you know, within the windows when the power, when the good grid can really afford it, and when, for example, if we have an overgen situation with so much solar to have the charging happen then. Yeah. Yeah. And just a comment on this kind of drafting behind, oh, you want to say it, okay, <laughs> behind Germany well, and Spain. Go, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I, I was going to make an economics comment. Oh, that's even better. So, so you know, okay, so economics 101 about electricity, right? And, and so historically, um, lots of variable costs to produce electricity on the margin. I've heard marginal costs in that question mentioned earlier, I think by Micah, maybe by Sheldon. And so what do we see? The key element is the technology is changing yeah. and we're getting way more capital cost and the variable cost for that production is going down and down and down. What's our tariff design? What rates do you pay? It's basically set up so that increasing costs to reflect an increasing marginal cost. That's not the future. That's not where we're at now. We need to realign our rates to match the underlying economics with a more significant fixed charge, and that's some of the controversy that David mentioned earlier in the, in the bill that was just passed, and actually probably a relatively low marginal cost for usage. And I can see a very different you know, use of the grid and the utility incentives very, very different in that kind of situation. Yeah. Interesting comment. Uh, I'm Shiba Raghavan. I have a question about this graph, actually. The solar thermal uh, first plan started in 1986 in SEGS, you had mentioned, and it, they're still working very well. Uh, in spite of it, you know, we don't notice that CSP has played a large part, a role in California, and it's not planning, you know, doesn't look like it's going to play. Is it um, California has great DNI, you know, uh, direct normal radiance for uh, solar thermal to work? The question is two part. You know, is it the manufacturing, you know, prowess of China which we can't make use for, you know, uh, large scale CSP deployment? Is it the storage part which actually could help with the base load? So, you know. so I mean, I, I just, yeah. Um, yeah. The thing that's changed, the solar thermal costs have really not changed in the last 30 years. It's basically the same technology, with the exception of the Ivanpah project I showed you with the towers. Um, you know, the, the cost is, at the same time, for a PV panel, which cost $35 in 1980, is 65 cents today, right, per watt. So, um, and so if you talk to developers, uh, and I've talked to a number of developers who've developed both solar thermal right. and PV, and they're just, you know, in a totally different order of magnitude. So they're just, there's not a lot of momentum. And it's not true for all, but there's also a water issue that comes into play. Yeah, there's so. Some projects too, and we can't leave that out of the equation. That's right, so that, that Ivanpah project I showed you with the three towers, I mean, they have a 12 inch gas line, they use 140 acre feet a year. The next generation of that technology, right. the tower is actually 750 feet tall, because what they're doing, they actually move, that way the mirrors can be in a smaller footprint, so it's less land, because the mirrors don't shade each other. But you can imagine, and I'm on a couple siting cases of these projects, and you know, the public comment we get about yeah. towers of that height is pretty significant, yeah. yeah. Sheldon, anyone else want to comment, Sheldon? Uh, 
I'm, I'm just going to jump in. Being on the on the sort of beneficiary side of that one <laughs> uh, in, in PV, um, I would say that you know the the number one thing that 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 um, thermal has to blame is 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 this right? I mean, it, it's the technology that goes into these these little devices and gadgets that we all spend billions of dollars advancing is what solar is benefiting from. Over, you know, it's a semiconductor learning curve, right? And whereas the learning curve around most of the technologies in a solar thermal plant, we're pretty far down those curves already. And so the, the, the slope of those curves is flattening out tremendously. And so you've got a technology in a relatively flat portion of the curve competing against the technology that's in a tremendously steep part of the curve still. And oh, by the way, it's also benefiting from a whole bunch of cross subsidy, subsidization in you know funding and, and, and technology R&D. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 not for lack of, of trying. I mean, lots of big companies took a crack at it in the last generation here. And, uh, in fact, standing behind you, right? Well, here uh, we go. He, so. he can <laughs> tell you a lot. <laughs> right, Archer can tell you a lot about it. And at a point when we can talk about not only SEGS but also about OSRA and, and about Sterling Energy, you get the last uh, question of the day, and we'll let all the panelists comment back, and then unfortunately we'll have to finish up after that. So. I, I'm Arthur Havenstock, formerly of BrightSource, and I wasn't planning to talk about solar thermal, although there is, <laughs> there is still a fair amount of cost curve for newer technologies, particularly CSP with storage, and abilities for CSP with storage to provide least cost, least emissions, reliability services that are harder for some other renewable technology to provide. But with that aside, what I really wanted to ask about is to follow up on what Todd was talking about earlier. When we look at the success of renewables in California, does it owe more to the international and national subsidization or to the regulatory requirements that were imposed both in California and elsewhere in the country? Question. And what does that say about what is to come? And when we look at the least cost, least emissions future that we're trying to attain, do we have the right regulatory structure? Is the stove piping that exists with the existing proceedings getting in the way? Do we have the right subsidies to try to achieve the ultimate low cost, least emissions future that we're looking for? I feel like should I should pay you some of my big moderator fee for what couldn't be a better last question. So I, I, I'm just saying, are there any PhD students out there? Because I just heard the topic for a dissertation that a lot of people are very interested in. And the answer is we don't know. And so there have been a bunch of assertions about What's relative cause and effect? Sorting it out requires probably a fair amount of interesting econometrics to do. But uh, I don't know the answer today, and I'm sure no one else here does, although we can assert all sorts of things. All right, good then. That's, that's, that's. <laughs> <laughs> I would describe it as a you know, very messy fruit cup of policies that's basically working. I mean, it's kind of like my cooking. Um, it's pretty, <laughs> the kitchen's a mess, but at the end of the day, you know, the kids are fed. Um, I, <laughs> and I kind of feel like it is raising a family, frankly. You know, I want every kid to succeed. Some take a lot longer to get out of the house, you know, but um, I basically feel like what we're doing right now, I mean, we need to be measuring results. I mean, we're at, what, 22% renewables today. We have yeah. A pathway to hit 33%. I absolutely believe we're going to get there. So I actually think, as messy as it is, um, it's working. And I mean, there need to be some course corrections and modifications. And but I basically think uh, we're, we're getting there. I, I thought the question isn't is it working? The question is why is, why it, is working? it working? I thought that's yeah. and that's a much harder question, yeah. right? Oh, we I think we all can agree that you know it's working in a number of different ways. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we're on a promising path for. Uh, a rosier future. We're actually, yeah, we're actually so close to being over. I, I got to get everybody in, but this is uh, this is exactly where we should be. Yeah, I'll just end. throw one one comment out. Someone, uh, I think you made the comment earlier that you know California is going to do what it does. Yeah, economics don't matter. Uh, couldn't uh, be further from the truth on <laughs> the customer side. So if you look, you know, for solar, for for distributed solar, there are three things that move the needle. It's the avoided cost of power. It's the incentives, and it's the amount of solar resource. Uh, you can make up for lack of solar resource with incentives, uh, but if you pay a lot for your power, uh, we're going to come in and take the customer and put a solar system on their roof. And that's what's happening in California because we have 45 cent tier 5, 30 cent tier 3. And, and that'll keep happening. So people are very rational actors on the customer side of the meter. And I think as long as you have policies that create economic incentive for for those decisions, people uh, will make uh, the right decision. And, uh, and again, the business models will come in and, and make that much easier. And let's also be clear that, there, that there's, we don't always do the right thing the first time, but there's a real concern about the, the environmental social justice aspect of, of high-priced power, too. So this is not 
kind of a we'll do the we'll just do whatever it, whatever it costs. I mean, there's a real push to make sure we do it right. Yeah, I I think um, I'm going to dodge the question a little bit by saying that it, there I'm sure is some sort of policy question and a PhD thesis to be written about about what <clears throat> has worked. Uh, I think I'm going to take a stab at what what is going to work going forward because I think we are in a situation where, and I'm not sure where, whether this is where you're going, Arthur, but I, but I'd like to see some of the stovepiping and siloing and all of that kind of knocked down a bit. It would be nice to start moving toward yeah. a more rational marketplace where there is more competitive forces that are driving some of these things and it's not just this VC got this thing pushed through for this technology and therefore there's a pro hobby horse program for it and all. You know, so I, I, I think we've come far enough, and I don't know why, what, what worked to date, but demand pull, you know, supply push from China, we don't know, but we're here, and I think going forward, yeah. designing a market that, that, that provides pull is, is going to be, um, there's enough technologies that are good alternatives that can compete now. Okay, so. okay you get the last comment of the day. <laughs> the last word. This is intimidating. Um, you know, just to second a lot of the things that Sheldon said, but I, I, I actually think the focus on pushing beyond 33% RPS is too narrow. I, I think we really need to be focused on the 2050 GHG goals, and that's, that's a much broader discussion. I mean, the power sector is only 20% of the emissions in, in California, and so we need to be thinking about everything, probably a lot more about transportation, although that will begin to blur with power as, as transportation is electrified. Um, but we need to, ha I agree, get rid of the silos, but have a much broader discussion about how to meet GHG goals. So, so that means next year's conference we'll be talking about the carbon content in goods and services and things we move around. So I want to thank our panelists and the audience. And Abigail's got some final words. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly announce the next step. We have two